what they do now, which is care for patients. You're going to hear from Mr. Lilly uh, and Robin, no doubt, that we GPs are probably assumed to be greedy interlopers in a system that would better be served by direct access to specialists. What Mr. Lilly really wants is a supermarket style of healthcare with patients able to choose a fast, slow, or the checkout queues in a 24 hour on tap healthcare. If we existed at all as GPs, he'd like us to be handmade into a foundation trust who would squash our independence and force us into managed care, rules based medicine, the way he thinks I suspect we deserve. But here's the paradox Mr. Lilly and others want the proverbial cake. They want to see the same GP whenever and wherever he wants. Impossible, of course, if me as a GP can sleep, eat, and undertake my daily personal habits. Access and continuity are on equal and opposite spectrums. You can't have both. You have to choose. He and many others want affordable health care, yet what they want is direct access to specialists and direct access to investigations. But according to all evidence, this raises causes impossible costs and costs to escalate. GPs, of which I am one and have been for 20 years, are the risk sink of the NHS. We are what makes the NHS affordable. Our skills at identifying one in 10,000 with serious pathology, protecting all the others from unnecessary procedures, tests and worries. GPs see undifferentiated illnesses. We sort out the wheat and the chaff. Put any symptom into Google, anything you choose, such as tiredness, headaches, night sweats, and you get 20,000 causes. We help to navigate you through the complex NHS soon. So, let's see what we as GPs provide to you in the NHS. Through us, you get the most efficient, most accessible, fairest, and most cost-effective health system in the world. That's not my words, but from the independent US think tank called the Commonwealth Fund. GPs see 1 million patients every day, 300 million patients every year. We see, we see complexity in which other countries would be immediately referred to specialists. So for example, not that long ago, I would refer any patient who needed to be started on an anti-cholesterol drug to hospital to be started. I would treat, see most patients, refer most patients who needed to be started on an antidepressant to a psychiatrist. GPs in the UK see the most complex and do the most than any other uh, practice the family doctor in the world. This morning I did my morning surgery, something I've done more or less every Saturday for 20 years. I saw a mixture of patients. I saw patients with substance misuse, a number with depression, one with back problems, one with housing problems, and a child with a fever. All done, more or less within 10 minutes, and all done, I hope, safely and efficiently. As a GP, we see patients in the context of their family and in the context of their environment. So I know, for example, that the patient I saw this week with migraine lived with a dysfunctional husband, a son gambles, a mother has dementia, dementia, all those contributing to her pain. But here is the problem, ladies and gentlemen, the GP of the future. We can't do it all. When I qualified, 70% of my medical school intake went to general practice. Now it's less than 30%. Most of us, as you probably will notice when you go into your practice, are female. Most of us are working part-time. The problem we've got is there's not enough of us. We only have three years training, and we're now expected to run the NHS between the morning and evening surgery. But if you want to continue, if you want to continue with a safe, effective, and kind health service, then you have to invest in GPs. If these new health service reforms are going to work, the only way you can, you can uh, judge their outcome is by you in the consulting room and what you feel and how you feel with your general practitioner. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't discuss and vote on this. We must have GPs and we must have more of us doing what we've been doing for the last six years. Thank you very much. He had a house, we had a flat, he had a car, we had a push bike. 
We were working class, he was middle class, he'd been to university and learned everything. We'd been to school and knew nothing. He had clean hands, and his house, which was his consulting room, didn't smell of dinner. He had a dining room, which was his waiting room. We sat up straight on his uh, spoon-backed mahogany chairs and never dared touch the mirrored surface of the double-leaf dining table with the apple wood inlay. His consulting room had French windows that opened onto a manicured lawn with roses that stood to attention. We had a yard where we leaned our bikes against the wall. He wore a waistcoat. We had jumpers. His wife was fragrant, and we were life <laughs> And we were life -boy. And he was better than us, but we didn't care. He was one of us. And when he died, we went to his funeral. And afterwards, at the reception, no one dared put a sherry glass on the mahogany table. I have no idea if he was any good. We had no way of knowing. We didn't care. We had faith. We still have faith. We have faith that GPs are people we trust and admire and that they can do the job. A job that will soon take them away from the safe territory of medicine into the minefield of management. The truth is, we've no idea if GPs are any good at managing at management, and no idea if they can commission £60 billion worth of health care. But there's more to the story. We thought we could have faith in them. We can't. Thanks to the King's Fund, there's now a big question mark over whether or not GPs are any good. Or good at being GPs, never mind running the NHS. The King's Fund passed a report last year into the goings-on in general practice. It tells us a lot we already know. There are the gatekeepers, there's a trend for larger practices, nurses are doing the stuff that GPs get paid for doing. More salary GPs, hunters getting more demanding and turning up irritatingly with more stuff going on. It also tells us it's still a cottage industry. There's a slow take up of telecare. More worryingly, the King Fund, King's Fund tells us because GP land is so complex, it's difficult to measure. Really, apparently there are gaps in the data sets. Well, well. Since 1948, we haven't come up with a way of measuring GP's performance. Well, well, perhaps they just don't want to be measured. Want some more money to worry about? So want some more to worry about? How about there are errors and delays in diagnosis, a wide range of referral rates between practices or GPs, and they are more likely to make a misdiagnosis of acute illness than they are non-acute. There's more. Recommended care is not reliably delivered to all patients with long-term conditions. Childhood immunizations take up is low, and the management of obesity is inconsistent. GPs are also going to need retraining in maternity care. As usual with the King's Fund, the report is polite. But let me put this into plain English. When I read this report and I look between the lines, I can only come to the conclusion that primary care is inconsistent and probably in large measure crap. The problem for the punter is they don't know who to rely on. They have faith in a romantic imagery, misty-eyed recollection, and, G and a GP brand that says everything that this report dispels. Consortia have been tried before in the US. They're called Independent Practitioner Associations. An expert in US health pol uh, policy has warned that only around a tenth of such consortiums were successful. Casalino, professor of uh, public health in the Veal Cornell Medical College in New York, analyzed more than 1,500 doctor-led groups set up in the United States. In a paper produced for the Nuffield Trust, he wrote only 150 were managing successfully. The US model flowered due to the lack of strong clinical leadership and underinvestment. In the not too distant future, the GP will be a budget manager. Well, it will be impossible to sit in front of him and be told, boy, you don't want to run the risk of an operation, some physio and a blister pack of painkillers will do the job and believe it. Is it really best for me? I think I don't know. Yes, I do. According to this, I'm being I'm being the audience will be the judge. Is he really doing the best for me? 
managing a budget or managing a budget to make savings for the year end. Is my operation really important, not important, or is his mistress's fur coat more important? That's the GP's role in the world. Today GPs do not have a role. They're doing a job, they're working, they're employed in healthcare, but they're stranded in a no man's land between vocation and commercialization. They are yet to define their new role. They don't know what they want. There's no clear voice that speaks for them, all because they don't speak with one voice. The BMA is split in its leadership. The CONFED has no discernible position. And with the exception of Lady Gaga from the RCGP, no one has the voice of the <laughs> There is a lacuna in the bill that allows GPs to set up a company and refer their own patients to that company for treatment. So they will be able to be paid twice, paid twice for the same treatment. So is it my job? It can't be. I'm not, I've measured eight minutes here. It can't be. I've stuck to time. It can't be eight minutes. Is it eight minutes? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right. If you want to cheat, you can cheat. But let me say, I don't know what the GP's role is. And the GPs don't know what the GP's role is. They're stuck between managing a budget and managing me as a patient. They've let their roles slip through their fingers and they will end up the servants of the companies that they are hiring to bail them out of the mess that they've got themselves into. Right. That was six and a half minutes. <laughs> I note from Roy's blog this week that Claire is to be referred to as Lady Gaga. Yes. I'd like to be referred to as the Maggie Smith of general practice. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? okay? And I'd like to call you Noel, and I'll decide by the end of this afternoon whether it will be deal or no deal. Okay. okay? We'll find out. We'll find out. We'll find out. Nobody's asked a patient whether they want another vast reorganisation. And nobody particularly asked the GPs whether they want to do the vast reorganisation. This is at least the sixth in my career. And as, as Bridget said, as the, though the Parliament is endlessly debating a health and social care bill which is yet to be passed, the infrastructure is already virtually dismantled and has yet to be mantled. The Titanic is sailing into the sea and we're all bobbing about in our lifeboats, heading for 2013. But at the same time, general practice is carrying on. The general practice that I've spent 30 years in carrying out a job that I love in the town of North Yorkshire. I'm a cog in a dedicated, multidisciplinary community and healthcare team. I'm intellectually stretched every day I work there, with the absolute privilege of being invited into the homes and lives of our practice population and helping them navigate through an increasingly complex set of local providers whose boundaries are finite while mine are seemingly infinite. In my time, town, we're competing with seven other practices, Roy. Patients are constantly choosing and changing between us. We're not all called Tesco. But others value the continuity of care that one practice over a lifetime can bring. I've provided care over five generations to several local families, and I have my first grandchildren in my practice on the behalf of my own in that sort of town. That continuity is shared between every member of my big multidisciplinary team, a team which includes two other doctors that have been there for 30 years. So as you can imagine, that we know our patients really well, just like the doctors of Roy's time. When I started all those years ago, I sat with a pen and paper, a prescription pad, the British National Formulary, and my instruments. And things have transformed completely since then. The only keyhole surgeon was finding the entrance to my practice in the dark, <laughs> and I'll call it that by myself. And quality referred to the box of Quality Street given to the receptionist by the local chemist, not the pharmacy, every business. But so, what is our role now? I'm now a general physician, still with 10 minute appointments, but I'm doing more in those 10 minutes than the general physician I worked for 40 years ago. I'm also expected to be a psychiatrist, a gynecologist, a dermatologist, and every otherist. And I'm berated by the Daily Mail for my lack of knowledge in all those areas, but I do it. And I work as well by day. I think that most GPs want to carry on doing that. 
Most GPs want to carry on being commissioned. <coughs> this is what we do. Commission, we can't actually then even start to do the commissioning without that knowledge. We need to adapt and diversify in response to our accountabilities, but we need to do that with incomplete probity. We need to continue being our patient's advocate and help them through the maze. Who else knows more about my local health services than me? I continue to look, I want to continue to look after all my patients within primary care. I, only one in 20 of them do I refer, and only 15% of the population gets into specialist health care. I want to continue doing that. But I also know that I can have a portfolio career whilst I'm doing that. I've been GP for 30 years, ranging from being a full-time senior partner in my practice to a part-time role, but seriously being a, serially, and seriously, and serially being a private care medical manager in a total purchasing fund, which is not far different from what GP Consortium are trying to do now. I've been a primary care medical director, a clinical governance lead, a hospital deputy medical director, and a non-executive and vice chair at NICE. Can I say not all at once, but it's given me an experience. But it can only be done if the clinical support for the patients remains paramount. And my time spent managing, commissioning, and supporting the national quality framework on behalf of those patients has always been replaced by other clinicians and other appropriate carers within my practice. GP commissioning isn't new, but the absolute responsibilities and accountabilities are. Before, we were all always under the umbrella of the health authority or PCT. And personally, I think that's the way it should always be. Someone said earlier, a clinic, clinicians and managers can work together. So, I also want to say that Roy handpicked what he wanted to say out of the King's Fund report. It actually said that the majority of GPs were excellent. And I'm a little bit upset that he's talking about he all the time. Because nowadays, the majority of general practitioners are women. I was cut off before I <laughs> <laughs> In my six minutes. Um, my team can do it all. I can't do it all, but my team can do it all. And I think we can take up this challenge, do it with probity, and get on with it. Thank you. Purpose in fashion the title to stand next to me, but I'll try and say something worthwhile. Um, I don't have the same day to day professional expertise of some of the other panelists, but I'm going to make a, a broader political critique of some of the changes that are underway in the health service. Um, some of the more perceptive commentary on the health and social care bill has made the point that rather than it simply being rebound tourism, um, the increased marketisation of healthcare. Uh, it's, not, it's actually totally in keeping with the Blair era so-called religious organisations of the 1990s and 2000s. Um, however, one thing those commentators have generally missed out on is that the flip side of the commercialised understanding of health promoted by the bill uh, is the Blairite's coercive and individualised victim blaming tendency that we've been seeing uh, going around in the health service over the past decade. So GPs have been losing a great deal of their professional autonomy in recent years. Uh, tendency that Claire can tell you about um, through things like the quality and outcomes framework, mandating particular ways to treat patients and arbitrary targets to hit. Who, whilst they've been losing ground in these traditional areas of the the state has found a new and expanded role for GPs and the hospitals more broadly. Uh, that's controlling the behaviour of patients uh, in the name of public health. So, let's take a brief look at some of the responsibilities of the family doctor today. Uh, they are required to help the government counter terrorism um, by uh, identifying people vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism. They need to help the police fight violent crime by informing police uh, when they're treating knife, knife crime victims as they pick a gunshot wounds. They need to identify gun owners with mental health problems and share that data with the police. They need to follow guidance on forced marriages. They need to be aware that some of the peak time for this. So they need to be on the lookout for evidence of young women self harming or lacking interest in academic work. They need to take a climate leadership role, um, using their position of trust to build support for action on climate change by promoting exercise, less meat in the diet. They need to become role models and ambassadors for healthy living, um, practicing safe sex, losing weight, that kind of thing. And um, they need to support, uh, you know, uh, when, when they have people who are being 
for operation, so it's smoke is obese and it's providing support to address these problems before referring them. They need to tackle health inequalities through culture change, advocacy and education. Um, they need to fill up bits instead of sick notes and help pick up and police the population in terms of um, employment. And perhaps unsurprisingly, be prepared for violence directed against them and operate a zero tolerance policy against this. So, whilst patient decision making is lauded rhetorically, um, for example, the white paper's backwards phrase, no decision about me without me, in the real world, patient autonomy is under greater attack than ever before. Um, Cameron and Nancy came in with promises of rolling back the nannying aspects of the state. After more than a decade of Blairite hectoring on sexual health, alcohol, smoking, and obesity, this seemed like a welcome suggestion. But in fact, they're planning to ramp up the nannying up under the auspices of the so called nudge agenda. Uh, nudge is the behaviourist uh, theory currently in vogue. So instead of compelling people by law, by taxation, to act in a particular way, uh, nudge theory attempts to change the so called choice architecture to make it easier to autonomously choose the supposedly correct option. Called libertarian paternalism by its originators, it has all these applications in marketing. So if you put crisps at uh, high level in a shop, people are more likely to buy them. Um, governments have taken to this kind of idea with gusto, for instance, we've opt out for other opt ins for things like organ donation. The coalition have been particularly keen. Um, Downing Street's behavioural insight team have been hard work um, piloting these kinds of interventions, including applying them to healthcare. So their discussion paper from last year points away to public health is headed. They suggest trialling so called social norm techniques to persuade Welsh students that their, pe that their peers are less than they think and to encourage them to do the same. They want to use iPhone apps, video games and children's TV programs such as Lazy Town to encourage physical activity and redesign shopping trolleys and change labelling to promote healthy eating. Uh, add to this uh, the new public health service that the Department of Health is launching, along with the ring sense of public health spending, it's clear that public health nudging uh, will take a key place in the government's plans for healthcare. As Lansing himself has been quoted, behaviour change is a great challenge for health. The reforms we are bringing uh, will empower you, professionals, to commission services to work to apply the best technology, best technology, the best new insights of social psychology and behavioural economics to achieve really improvements in health. But what's the problem with this? Surely there's, um, there's nothing objectionable about the government promoting healthcare <coughs> behaviour in the public. Well, I think there are a number of issues here. Firstly, uh, these kinds of interventions get the purpose of the health service the wrong way round. The social contract that people will be provided with health care for their own needs and purposes as when they need it is being broken down. The state and its financial pressures come prior to people's autonomy to choose their own lifestyles. To paraphrase uh, Bertolt Brecht's critique of the oldest German government, the government is trying to dissolve the public and elect a healthy one whether we want it or not. Uh, secondly, uh, they promise to further denigrate the doctor patient relationship. A collaborative effort to achieve the diagnosis and the cure is being morphed into an exercise in making the public behaviour in a manner that's cheaper for the exchequer. There's also the question as to whether this kind of intervention actually works, which I think is an open question at best. And then finally, this is the point of autonomy. If a choice is structured, uh, so you choose the right outcome, or only chosen by someone else, then it isn't really a choice. Such a subtly coercive agenda isn't worthy either of a political system supposedly constituted of equal citizens, or of medicine supposedly based on the autonomy of patient. So I'll leave it there. Great. Not for the vast majority of their, their life. 
But the thing is, we don't do it on our own. I do not do everything. We have an enormous multidisciplinary team uh, that supports us doing that. And I think Maggie and I are absolutely Yes, absolutely. As Rita said. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that. We're on the same side, Maggie and I are. We didn't complain that we were cut short in our prime. <laughs> Right, um, it sounds to me like you're basically uh, suggesting that the social contract that Robin alluded to, that that's well and truly gone, and what's replacing it is anything but desirable. Yes, the point uh, I was trying to make before I was cut off so calculatedly, no, the, the, the point I, I was trying to make is we all have a romantic notion of, of what our GP was. And, and in a sense, that's been really rather reflected in, in what our two GPs have said. Um, they're both sat here and told us you know, what wonderful things they're doing for their patients and, and dreary and how hard they work and the rest of it, like they want to them work and the world work hard. Everybody works hard. But they, they are reproducing, really, that image that I started off with. What's happened is the government is... is um, of avalanching them now with the responsibility for 60 billion quid with the healthcare commissioning, which the sensible doctors will say, look, we can't do, we're going to have to hire people in to help us do it. Most of them, in most of the polling, even Claire's own organisation, when, they, when she polled her GPs, the GPs don't want to do this because they know that it will change the fulcrum point in the relationship that we have with our GP. The GP will have to look you in the eyes and say, I'm not going to prescribe this, I'm not going to send you here or there because I have a lot of money to do it. That changes the fulcrum point. They got themselves into this mess through lack of leadership, lack of vision, lack of understanding, or greed. They might actually want to do it. So the jury's out. But I think they're going to become Dr. No, and they'll pay the price for that. And I think that the, the public will turn it. I don't think we did ask for this. As Maggie said, nobody, but nobody asked me whether I wanted this health and social care bill. Nobody asked me, ahead of the dissolution of PCTs, whether I wanted to be <coughs> Nobody has asked GPs. I have asked GPs, and 75% of the GPs that responded do not want to do it. Then why are you doing it? Because we live in a democracy, and we, what on earth, I mean, I, I think we've got to not muddy up the two debates. There is a debate about the role of the GP in the future, and there is a debate about whether general practice can survive the onslaught, uh, not just from, from the feminisation of my profession, and the 2.7% vacancies are dropping, uh, there's fewer and fewer of us working more and more part-time. That's the first thing. On top of that, whether it can survive the onslaught of the health and social care world, which as Roy absolutely rightly says, and, and eloquently says it most days in his blog, and we are very good friends by the is going to destroy the doctor-patient relationship. Because in the end, you have to trust that I'm doing for you in your best interest. You have to trust it. You can argue, you can shout at me, you can disagree, like the patient today wanted esotelogram and oxytelogram, there's a 20 pound difference in it with the same efficacy. I said, sorry, you're getting to tell her, we'll, we'll manage it. She has to trust that I'm doing that for evidence-based practice in her best interest, not because I'm going to get a back pocket uh, quality provision for it. So I think we're in a broad group, but there's well, two different Claire, ways. I mean, I think people should really understand this quality premium. Well, it, 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 it's, it's a very dis, uh, misleading phrase. What it says in the bill, in simple everyday uh, language, <coughs> is that if the GPs will be given a budget to buy your health. If they save money on that budget, it will come back to them as a bonus. The bill actually says that that bonus can be distributed at the discretion of the consortium. It doesn't say the money has to come back into better health care, into new kit, hiring nurses. It says at their discretion. So if your GP doesn't want to buy his mistress a fur coat, then tough luck for you. It's, 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 it's what's called a lacuna, it's a gap in the bill. Okay, can I, so I'm going to bring Maggie in, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask you specifically to comment on something that uh, Robin talked about, which was the behaviour management and all of the additional roles that you are expected to like identify people who might be. I've done it 
and you have no problem with that? No, it, I don't, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to... How can I phrase this? What I am always prepared to do, for example, with the person that is, uh, I'm asked, do they need, uh, are they appropriate to have a firearm, which is the sort of thing that you were talking about, is what always amuses me is that even though I know a lot about people, I don't know everything about people. And all I can ever do is reply with the information I have to my disposal. That, that doesn't mean to say that that person is the right person to have a firearm, because I might not have that information. But I am prepared to divulge what I feel is appropriate with the patient's consent and with their knowledge that I am, I am doing that. I'm going to do it any other way. And I'm also, if I am going to be talking to them about diabetes or obesity, very happy to talk about behavioural change and to try and use those techniques because we're not going to get me medicines aren't the only way of, of, of um, adapting one's health. So I, I mean, I think that's part of what I've done, and I'm sure what Claire's done, um, all our working life. And I don't think any any GP would be doing anything different. <coughs> So that's my response to that. Behavioural change is something that you learn. Okay. And finally, Robin, before I go up to the audience to ask, um, you were very critical of the nudge agenda, but I'm not sure that um, you know it does uh, attempt to address difficulties that people have. And what's wrong with doing that? And what's wrong with bringing GPs alongside to do that? Um. I suppose there's a number of issues here. There's a kind of practical issue. Does lifestyle change lead to better health outcomes, which the jury is out on? There is difficult to say data. There's a second question, which is do government initiatives lead to lifestyle change? The answer appears to be not really. Um, so, yeah, things like uh, brief interventions against smoking, basically using every opportunity if someone comes in with an ingrown toenail or something like that, say, having people smoking or smoking. There is, uh, if you read the nice documents, um, probably state there is insufficient evidence to say whether this works. Uh, Fail to detect any, uh, any effective advice uh, interventions. So it doesn't appear to work. There are, you know, here's how to be, can be debated over. But then there's a the more moral question. I do think what Matt would say that if someone comes in with COPD, um, emphysema, or bronchitis, and you say stop smoking because it will make it worse, that's an exciting thing for a doctor to do, and I think that's totally fine. Versus this kind of population <coughs> idea that the government is promoting, which is not about the individual, it's about driving down costs for the government and about enabling the state to gain control over the population rather than about ethical, you know, kind of relationship you have with an individual, which is the key point in your doctor. Right. We've had, there's a lot of stuff out there now that it would be really good to have some comments, feedback, responses from you. I'm looking into the lights, so it's actually quite hard to see. I feel like I'm on stage here. Um, I can see, all right. There's a woman here with glasses. Um, I wonder if the government's motivation behind both getting GPs to commission health services and behind the behavioural management approach to healthcare is all really about rationing of healthcare. And, um, you know, I think that in terms of commissioning, then, uh, you know, that, that, that they think that basically GPs will be more effective at rationing than even local commissioning PCT so uh, you know as, as we have said that uh, GP looking in the eye and telling you sorry we can't do that and in terms of behavioural management I think that it's all linked in to the sense of the deserving and the undeserving sick and we all know that this is very really affecting people's access to treatment um, whether you want IVF and smoke um, in the Wales, where they will not allow you to have IVF on the NHS if you smoke, if you do not, and they will test you for your carbon monoxide levels, and you'll have to prove, have proof that you've been on smoking cessation, and uh, or with surgery and all sorts of other things. Um, 
So I think that's the main uh, driver behind these things. And it's just the panel's opinion on that. Thank you. There's a woman in the check shirt and then the guy behind her. Um, I just wanted to, to ask Roy, I don't understand what you're, where you're coming from and what you're pr proposing. Um, I quite share your idea about um, concern, if I've understood it, about what the GPs are going to have voiced upon them. But I find your description of the GPs as uh, extremely offensive, actually. But I would like to know what you think should be the case. Thank you. Are there a guy behind Thanks. Yeah, it's just about um, I think there is a misperception um, about who is in the commission and the fact that GPs not only have to do the clinical work but now are commissioners. I don't think that's technically true. I mean, as Maggie said, GPs have been involved in the commissioning process for many years. They sit on several platforms and there are things called practice commissioning groups that already exist. Um, it, and as Maggie put, the, the real question is, is that shift in responsibility? That's what GPs now have. They have that ultimate responsibility. But in terms of the commissioning function, it, it, they're going to have to bring in people who already have that as their day-to-day -day job to come and fulfill that function. But how that looks in this new clinical commissioning group is a big question mark. Thank you. I'll take one more point. You guys at the very back, and then come to the panel. <coughs> Thank you. I'm a, I'm a GP, uh, and I've, I, as a GP, just to, by way of introduction, I would like to pay tribute to Claire's role in mobilising the Royal College of GPs in opposition to the uh, NHS. <laughs> it's a major advance, particularly on the, the rather equivocal role it played in the past. I would like to take issue with the, issue, the, the contention that the uh, NHS and uh, Social Care Bill, whatever it's called, the NHS reforms, are the major threat to the doctor-patient relationship. Because it seems to me that that, uh, and this is at Roy, it seems to be also Roy Lilly's emphasis, that the major problem is the extension of bureaucratic intrusion of um, um, uh, commissioning relationships, rationing decisions in, in between doctors and patients. It seems to me a much bigger problem, I think, and Robin Walsh is right to emphasise this, is the expansion of the role of general practice over the last longer period, 20 years, from the direct dealing with patients as they present with particular illnesses and diseases to the role, taking on the role of public health practitioners managing the health of whole populations. And I think that's, like Robin, I've, I've kept a burgeoning file of issues which GPs are ideally placed to deal with. In fact, you seem to have collected a few that I've missed uh, about terrorism and spotting uh, uh, people with knife injuries and all the rest of it. But GPs are ideally placed to deal with virtually every conceivable problem of the modern world. And that notion of the expansion of general practice takes place with this conviction of the public, and the problem of the public health outlook is the public health outlook, public health <coughs> in its whole approach to the individual, they've got no respect for our patients is the basic problem. They regard our patients as people who are encouragingly committed to filthy lifestyles and dirty forms of behaviour and bad habits which cause all sorts of diseases. And so that the, the dominant role into which they want to uh, push GPs is towards managing these sorts of behaviours and transforming the lifestyles of our behaviour. Now, I don't, unlike Margaret, I don't accept the, that it's a useful conception of the role of GPs uh, to change the behaviour of their patients. My patient's behaviour is up to them to sort out. I regard my responsibility as a doctor is to deal with the problems that they bring to me as a doctor to diagnose and treat their diseases. Their behaviour is up to them to sort out. And the comprehensive sort of intrusion in people's lifestyles and in their individual personal behaviours and their, uh, their selfhood that goes under the rubric of the new style of, of public health general practice seems to me to be the major threat to the doctor-patient relationship. And that's something which has existed longer than the NHS reforms and will go on longer than them is, is the, the real problem. It seems, in relation to that, there's an element of complacency about my GP colleagues on the platform here. I mean, I too have been a GP for many years and like them I celebrate them and I've greatly enjoyed uh, the job and I enjoy it now. But I think we have to recognise the consequences of this tremendous shift that's happened over the last 20 years in the relationship between doctors and patients. And recognise that, you know, we can be 
we can ignore, and this is a, applies to the wider discussion of the NHS reforms and the whole notion of saving our NHS and keeping it public and everything else, which is to underestimate the extent to which many of our patients have a very inferior experience of the quality of service they receive from the NHS. And I think Royal Lily usefully points up some, some issues here. It's more a problem of hospitals than it may be of general practice, but we do have to think when we're saying defend our NHS, keep it public, what about Winterbourne View? You know, what about Staffordshire hospitals? What about all these other exposures of the poor standards that exist in throughout the NHS? What about some of the exposures of general practice and the total inefficacy of the General Medical Council in dealing with these problems? Most GPs do a good job, we're very well paid for it. Some GPs do a crap job and are very badly managed when, they, when that comes up. Okay, I want to ask the panel now to respond to something that there's lots of stuff out there, so please feel free to answer. Okay, well, I just run through them. Um, um, the, the lady that talked about rationing, yes, you're right. Um, the, uh, the pressures on the healthcare system, the collapse of international economies and so on has put us in the middle of a perfect storm. This is not the time to reorganise the organisation, but we are. So you're right, and the government's thinking is that they can put GPs in a position where they will put a rationale behind the use of resources. And they will hide behind the GP's rationale. The fact is, it's rational. And you're going to have to do it. And, and you know, listening to everyone describe the value of the relationship between the doctor and the patient, my contention is, to, uh, to come to your point, is that that will, that will damage the relationship. It's you know, my friend in the business is, I don't know whether they're still looking after me or looking after themselves. I can't tell. And I won't be able to tell. And I'm not proposing anything. It's not my job to propose anything. It's my job to, to observe and comment. And that's my observation and that's my comment. I think GPs have got themselves into a stupid place through lack of foresight, leadership. They've been beguiled by politicians. There's been hubris in the large organisations. They've got themselves into a mess. And it's a mess of their own making. As far as the uh, commissioning influence is concerned, I think you're wrong. I think um, the GPs have been influencing um, in some parts of commissioning, but not very much because the structure of PCTs was such that GPs couldn't do it. Uh, it would be easy uh, if we wanted to give GPs more influence in commissioning, add greater weight to commissioning, uh, then we could do that by reducing the number of PCs to 50, change the board structures to have uh, docs in the majority, and have a management cost cap to stop the, the, the cost running away with it. But, but um, so I, I don't agree with, with you that they've been doing it, and they've been influencing, now they're going to have to do the whole nine yards, and I don't think they can do it. Already they are rehiring the PCT people who have been made redundant and doing deals with people like Kaiser Permanente and United Healthcare and others to come in. Uh, in London they've spent £7 million on sending doctors on training courses on how to manage, but, and they've sacked the managers. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I don't agree yet. The final, uh, the final thing was this business about the public health function, if I may. In 1969, a public health doctor said, Thomas McEwen said, in terms, governments have done everything they can in public health, uh, adult education, reading, clean water, immunization. The rest is the extent to which government is prepared to interfere in the lives of ordinary people. He invented the concept of the nanny state. What happened? It's only the law that changes people's behaviour. Crash helmets, seatbelts in cars, smoking in the workplace, health and safety. You can nudge, push and bribe as much as you like. It's the law that changes behaviour. Okay. Um, I think what I would like to say about the, the discussion about rationing is that I think it's going to be a very real discussion for, for us all and that perhaps we all as a population need to think about what we want from our NHS. Um, irrespective of who's commissioning it, we've got to save £20 billion. Pounds. I'm not quite sure where all that's going to come from. Um, and we do need to have um, discussions about what's affordable and what isn't affordable. Um, now, whether those are between the patient and the GP, I don't know, but I think they also need to be at a higher level, and I, that, that's what I'd like to say about that. Um, I agree with, with Roy about um, uh, the only law changing behaviour, but I'm naive enough to think, and perhaps as a good GP think I ought to at least advise 
and discuss with my patients things that they might like to think about. Um, I've been meeting the same patients for 30 years and I know quite a lot of them take up one blind with notice, but that doesn't stop us having a conversation and a chat and a smile and, and let's see how we're going. And it doesn't stop me managing their diabetes or their COPD even if they're still smoking. But I feel absolutely it's part of my training that I do need to give them all the information that I can and access to that information. Um, and I think that is very much part of my role. Thank you. Yesterday, uh, I saw a patient, a young man, who was very depressed. And I had to make a decision. What do I do? The weekend's coming up. So I saw him, treated, managed, and what's called safety netted in terms of the general practice field. Big responsibility. Even now, I'm worried about him. So what I'd like to say is that I don't shirk my responsibility. I have not shirked my responsibility. I could quite easily have sent him up to casualty, but I didn't. I don't send every patient. Government shouldn't shirk their responsibility. They make big decisions like how much money we spend in health, or whether you have to close hospitals, or whether you can get IVF in Wales, needs to be made by government. Of course we can help them do that. We've got NICE, we've got other bodies, we've got SIGN in Scotland. But fundamentally, decisions like that have to be made by national statutory bodies accountable, accountable to Parliament. This, and when I hear that GPs have to ration and we ration anyway, do you know we do ration anyway, but we do it in a very subtle way and it's, it's done very carefully, it, it, but we don't ration big decisions. And the problem is going to be, ladies and gentlemen, when GPs take over CCGs, GPs will be decommissioning, because there's no money, they'll be cutting services, and they will be rationing, and that's not what I want for my profession. And yeah. that's why yeah. I'm very worried. I would say I need more support because actually the managers haven't come out. I haven't heard a single manager, and it's not just the medical profession that's been cowardice about this. I haven't heard yes. organisations like the NHS Confed coming out and saying, we don't want to do this. So that's what I have to say. The, the issue about public health, I've listened to my years and I really respect them. You have changed my view, but I don't fundamentally agree. I think the nudge agenda is nonsense. I think it is a nonsense agenda. Uh, nudge, you know, but what it actually means is a cop-out, a cop-out to use uh, the industry, the drinks industry, all of that, to say, we'll use that to try and persuade patients, persuade people. Well, actually, as Roy said, you either change the law, crash helmets, or you let people get on with their own. However, on the other hand, there is evidence about brief and minimal intervention, so I think we shouldn't throw that out. There is some evidence around smoking cessation, there is evidence around cutting the alcohol, but I think, we, that it, I think it's another way that government abdicating their responsibility by this nonsense and nudging them. If they want to reduce the, the hundreds and thousands of lives of alcohol problems, they would do it through, a, through, through the, the, the legal system, not through asking me to, to gently nudge somebody from drinking 100 units a week to drink 20 units a week. Thank you. <laughs> Don't quote me. Don't encourage it. Four weeks alone. There's, uh, there's a, a, a few points here that I'm, I want to deal with. I think the point of what the government's motivation is, it's a difficult one. No one really knows. Obviously, there's probably what Andrew Lansley would complain, that it's an honest, rational attempt to improve services. I don't think even he would believe. Um, there's what you might call the conspiratorial uh, explanation, which you saw there was a book called The Plot Against the NHS, and there was a recent article in the London Review of Books, which I thought was, was quite a good article. Kind of had a, a full of money way of trying to work out what was going on. So, worked out the links between Labour health ministers, um, KPMG, American HMOs, people in the BMA, and there's definitely some good stuff out there, but I don't think it fully grasps it, because there's, you know, a, a secular trend towards marketisation across education and welfare reform, so you, you have to have a situation where the entire British state is thoroughly corrupt for about 20 years, which I don't think actually grasps what's going on. I think what the other people have uh, been saying is right, um, there's a quite about this in the authority, so the government has a provision how to improve the health service so they get other people to do it for them. Um, I think part of this is also talk of welfare, so they're attempting to find cash into the sclerotic private sector because they can't find any other way to do it. I guess just on, on the point, um, Mike raised the issue of the GMC being uh, inefficacious, but 
um, which yeah, may, may well be correct, but the, the flip side of that is the GMC have recently been attempting to regulate the behaviour of doctors outside their professional um, auspices in, you know, in, in their private lives as well. So it's, the GMC is a very strange organisation. I think part of its expansion of what it's trying to do um, comes down to the fact that it's taken under state control about 10 years or, or so ago. It's no longer self-regulating um, in the medical profession. Finally, um, yeah, I'd like to agree with what, what, <laughs> what other people were saying, um, that essentially all of these areas, if they are areas, for, they're not the business of healthcare, it's an issue for the law, uh, and it's a, it's a business of politics. If the government wants to win the argument that certain things should be banned or should be restricted, they need to do that politically, they need to go out and they need to argue that with the population. They haven't been able to do that, and so they're attempting to kind of subverts our ability to make our own choices, which I think is profoundly dangerous in, you know, both of the six Okay, we'll cut it off from here. Um, okay, there's two people here in the front, and there's a guy at the back. Hi, uh, a year ago I stood up and said to the <coughs> members, um, I, uh, I'm only here uh, today because my GP has saved my life. And basically that was done in not sort of perhaps a normal way. It was me finding out the fact of treatment that was you didn't know about local me and he helped me to get it. So, you know, you are the GPs basically, but I also know that not all the GPs are perfect. Um, after coming here, I then, as I said there earlier, uh, I looked into the um, into the substance of the health and social care bill more fully. I didn't come from a, a social economy and public health background, so I was able to go, I thought, oh my god, this is a nightmare. And I, together with a, a, a GP, a Lewis, we sat up with an SLS and NHS, and I've basically been tracking the bill ever since, and um, uh, essentially, what, what uh, you were saying about the marking and washing of the blur, actually, it was before that, it was under Thatcher. And as Lord David Owen wrote so eloquently in his face in the floor document, what we're now faced with is the external market, which is different. The, the, you know, the labour model and the factual model are about the internal market. This is about the external market. And absolutely, this is going to drive the coaching horses through the doctor patient relationship. And it's also, it's not just simply the doctor patient relationship, it's the doctor doctor relationship between. Hospitals and GPs far more profoundly than hitherto. Um, in terms of public health and the nudging and whatnot, I did a lot of work as your starts, all up, down, between, inside, out, really. <coughs> evaluated by numerous of them. And of course, now they're being cut back. And uh, if we think about the Green project in Corby, which was the start of Shaw's starts, that is only open for the foreseeable 12 months and they then close. So, you know, the, the cuts are actually biting into what we know is excellent practice. And that isn't just from GP sitting saying, you know, probably best to stop smoking. This is about, I don't know whether you want to call it much, but this is about educating parents in numerous communities who previously didn't have the opportunity to find these things out. This is not about hectoring and lecturing them. This is about working with them. Early intervention works. So please do not knock it. Okay, can you pass me back to the next question? Uh, I was going to say a few things. From a lifetime in education, I was going to do that. Um, and I think that whole list of things that Lauren was going on about, uh, that teachers have been asked to do those, it's for the last 30 years. I mean, it's not a big deal in a way, in the focus uh, there that I uh, want to lecture. You know, people go on drinking, they go on smoking, but they can do your best.
there may be lots of factors without any severe regulation, but I'm afraid the government has more of this. They look at the back. Um, I think Dr. Dowd have been very eloquently put your view or maybe the Royal College's view <coughs> across. I just wonder why the general public doesn't know it. And secondly, if 75% of the us, the Royal College members oppose the bill, why don't they strike? <laughs> 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 I wanted to ask two questions if I could, in particular about our GP colleagues. I'd like to ask whether they think there is room now for, for the, the old misty-eyed view of a, of a single-handed GP anymore. Uh, certainly in my profession, where you can't really kill anybody, um, the idea of a single professional working on their own is very much distrusted, uh, and the idea that people should have professional autonomy uh, to make decisions themselves without at least some uh, peer pressure to uh, bow to uh, 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 professional standards. Uh, you know, that, that's a really contentious area. I just wondered what your thoughts were in, in, in terms of GPs. The, the second question is really, what does, what does government think GPs' role is? Um, I, I do find it quite hard to put down to just incompetence. The fact that the, the previous government uh, took away the, the uh, requirement to provide 24 hour care at the same time that it gave GPs a 52% pay rise over three years. And I don't begrudge them that pay rise, I think people only deserve it. <coughs> But you know, it's really hard to, to, to not interpret that as government being quite cynical in terms of uh, paying off the people that it sees as its only um, uh, method into uh, areas where it believes it has, has largely lost control. Uh, and I wonder whether people th thought that that's me just being a bit of a conspiracy theory. So whether you know, this further attempt now with the reforms to throw a load of money at GPs just indicates that that's what government's really about. Okay. Just a uh, oh, sorry. 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 Closing their doors and being be merged, being taken over, etc. So I think the issue about single-handed, I've always been a protagonist of single-handed practices. I think it's nonsense and rubbish to always assume you have to be in large practice in order to survive. I think single-handed practices invariably come up very high on patient satisfaction, and I think there's lots of isms that can be added if you think that single-handed equals poor performance, which has always been the sort of the underlying assumption they're not. But just beware. If we're not being handed vast sums of money, GPs are not for general practice, they are to purchase your secondary care. And to put things in perspective, ladies and gentlemen, the, the cuts, the actual cuts that we're going to experience in NHS will take us to the bottom of the league of the OECD average for health spend. We're already pretty way down the bottom of the league at about £2,700 per patient per year. We're going to go down to £2,500 per year. Pounds per patient per year. The next up to us is about three thousand, three and a half thousand. So let's be clear about this. We're being handed a poisoned chalice. With respect to the RCGP, of course GPs are going on strike. They never have and they never will. The only time they threaten to go on strike, and it was in the just after the NHS, it's a lovely story, just after the NHS was formed in about 1955, what happened was they were all working incredibly hard doing 70, 80 patients a day, 30 to 40 visits, they were overwhelmed, very low pay. So they decided to go on strike. And in fact, they didn't go on strike. What they decided to do was not send in their bill to the government or the local government every month. So that they decided not to be paid. <laughs> they decided not to be paid. And this went on for a month. And it caused such an outcry that the government came in and gave them some money. So that was the opposite of strike. I thought it was very sweet, actually. <laughs> so that was their call to action, not to be paid. Okay. Anybody else on the panel want to come back? Um, yes, sir. So, <laughs> just to, I, I think single-handed professional, I think it's, now it's more single-handed practice. Um, certainly, the local single-handed practice in my area, it actually doesn't exist anymore, but when it did, 
team around him and with him were, were great. And as, as uh, Claire said, they performed exceedingly well, probably because of the wonderful content. Again, it was a continuity of care and that trust relationship with, with that particular practitioner. Um, the other thing about the 24-hour care, um, it wasn't safe, to be honest, if we look at it in, in, in other ways, it wasn't safe that I was up in there maybe all night and then coming to work next day, um, and that isn't right. And when it was rearranged initially into our local GP cooperative, it in fact worked very well, and then we stopped doing that, which I think was absolutely outrageous, because at that point, you could still, you still got a general practitioner coming out to see you at night, had access to your records because we had a compiled clinical computer system, and was able to tell their own GP the next day what had happened. Um, since that was sort of privatised and put to PCTs, I think it's not any good at all. Okay, um, right, just a quick round up. Um, on the, the gentleman's idea of a strike, um, when the, uh, the government proposed to change the planning regulations, um, the National Trust, uh, who do have quite a lot of members and some pretty high powered members of their board, said to government, you can do what you like, we're not going to engage with you on this, we won't talk to you about it. Now, without a big organisation like the National Trust getting involved in changes to the planning, it was impossible to do. In my view, the BMA should have woken up really early and said to the government, listen, you can do what you like, but our members want to talk to you. Thanks very much. Cheerio, we don't want to do it. They had the opportunity there and they missed it. Because the BMA, first of all, misinterpreted what their members really wanted. The members didn't want to do it. And secondly, they thought through the old boys network and a gin and tonic on the terrace of the House of Commons they could sort all this out. Well, they haven't. And now Hamish Meldrum and his crew are in a mess. And I'd rather suspect they'll be voted out next time around. As far as the bill is concerned, there are three things in the bill that removes the duty of the Secretary of State uh, to provide health care. There's still palavering around it. And the McKay Amendment, which the Lords look like they're going to vote on, does not solve this. It only says that the Secretary of State has powers in the event of an emergency. So don't be fooled by that. GPs of rationals, of course, are in the bill. And the, the private sector role, well, you know, why do we have a market anyway? Scotland don't, Wales don't. I've spent all my life in business. I've never had a proper job. I've always run my own businesses. And I tell you, you do not want businesses running healthcare. You certainly don't want people like me running <laughs> and, and just uh, my final point is uh, on where did all this come from? No one voted for this because no one had the opportunity to vote for it. But if you want to see the genesis of it, go to andrewlandley.co.uk, look at a speech he made to the Confederation of NHS Trusts on the 9th of July 2005, two days after the London bombing, which is why it's got no publicity. The seven point, he's a 4,000 word speech, seven points in there, which describe exactly what's in the bill. And if you think the Liberal Democrats are off the hook, they're not. On the 9th of September, 2005, on the third page of the independent newspaper, Little Cleggy Boy was interviewed and said that we absolutely agree the NHS should be broken up. They are in this together. Oh. Yep, yeah, um, I'll come back with a couple of things. Just uh, following up on what Roy said about the BMA, uh, they were fairly effectual in defending their members of modernising medical careers, and people remember that a few years ago, so I don't think it's anything new with a lot of leadership and medical pressure up and pay off this. It's somewhat ineffectual. Um, <laughs> you can't have a good go because she's here. <laughs> um, and, and sort of coming back to the point of, of the legacy of Toryism and the kind of thatch of those reforms, I think you're right. So, for instance, the, the um, internal market is a thatch of era uh, reform, but then also the, the initiative towards more public health, more coercive public health that we have nowadays, came about under the major, um, I think it was the health of the nation report in 1992. So I think the two are definitely linked. Um, and the, the old stories at least did, did have some respect for personal autonomy, which the current government don't really need, because it did the Blair government. Um, I think one thing, just a, a kind of point to throw out there, to compare the old Tories versus what they're doing at the moment. Uh, health inequalities are mentioned throughout the Health and Social Care Bill, which is very a mark, mark contrast between the Black Report in 1980, which was effectively suppressed by the Thatcher government, 
Um, that's basically because class is now seen as a lifestyle choice and needs to be alleviated by government advice on how to behave correctly, make sure of weight trials and be more middle class, instead of a social phenomenon that could be alleviated either by reform or something more, more drastic. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I suppose I could leave it there. There's an old no, I quote that the NHS will survive as long as people are there to fight for it. I think the, the underlying thing here is that the organised working class, which was the group that um, was the driver kind of the foundation of the NHS, is no longer there to fight for itself. So I think that that's the, the real uh, unspoken tendency that's going on here. And also because nobody truly thinks the worst is going to happen, because you never think the worst is going to happen. And also, none of us truly know, truly understand what it's like to worry about healthcare. The recent Commonwealth Fund was published actually only a couple of months ago, when they asked the question 11 industrialised countries whether you didn't access health because of costs, only 3% in the NHS in the United Kingdom said they worried about access, and I suspect that was people accidentally ticking the wrong box. Whereas 60%, so two thirds of Americans worry about it. And I think I saw something on Twitter the other day, I followed this, and it was a, and I say it, it was a, a, a somebody who was complaining, he sort of said, Oh, I really like spending £10 on my shower gel for my eczema because my GP forgot to put it on prescription. And I wanted to write back to him and say, Listen, <coughs> I was going to use the word tea, but I said, Listen, do you not understand how lucky you are that it is only costing, that you're getting it for free anyway on the NHS? That actually maybe things like that shouldn't be available on the NHS, and maybe in the future won't be. There are people every 12 minutes in America who die from lack of, of basic health care. And I think all of us have no idea. The older ones will, pre-NHS, but none of us have a single idea. And I think that's what it is. It's not that there's a working place, we just have no concept of it. Like we've no concept of what it's like to be frightened uh, or in fear of our lives. Uh, and I just oh, sorry, 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 <laughs> just sorry. Just sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't let the story. Um, can I see if there's any more questions from the audience? Because we don't have time left. And Okay, there's two people the middle here, so you're all going to chat, yes, please. Do you think that the government's market, uh, or market-based reforms are in danger of undermining the, the sort of altruism that is traditionally underpins the NHS? Good question.
And Claire, can I just ask you a question about the board elected on the basis that you said you wanted to address health inequalities, and I wonder what you meant by that. I won't, in a minute. <laughs> and, sorry, who else is there? This is very difficult to see. And yes, we have uh, two things just very quickly. Um, a, a friend of mine in the States uh, has to keep a job that she hates because her daughter had yeah. thyroid cancer and her daughter is now aged 25 and is no longer covered by her medical insurance and therefore she won't be able to have her daughter's thyroid cancer treated uh, in the future. So she had to stay in that job to keep the medical insurance. Their, their lives are governed by medical insurance. Nobody in this country thinks about the job that they're going to have based on a medical insurance cover. So I just feel very sad about that. The other thing that I, I, I'm wondering about is the role of the private sector. Where are these people? What's actually happening? Are they bidding for contracts? What about Google, PPP? Are they taking credit? What's going on? Okay. I'm slightly worried that we're getting into technical discussions about the NHS and we're actually talking about the role of the GP. Yeah. And there's been a lot of criticism made about, you know, whether it's the behaviour management, etc. And some people are very dismissive dismissive of nudge as a cop-out. And I, I think my Fitzpatrick's points at the back were, I think, quite salutary and, and certainly made me think that there is a lot more going on in the health service that's kind of happening but not being talked about. But the, the focus is on the health bill as opposed to all these other things. And we're being a little bit blasé about all of that because I think it will have an incredible effect on the doctor-patient relationship. And the, 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 this whole notion that you can trust your GP might be uh, called into question when you think your GP might have another agenda that is that's been forced on you as opposed to what you want addressed by the GP. We are kind of running out of time, so I'm going to ask people to set them up, and, but in reverse order. So, Robin, are you ready for this? Uh, just talk about. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose the, the point to make about a lot of other choices and whether the, you know, the state, the NHS and the individual is responsible for that is that ultimately if the NHS only treated people who made the correct lifestyle choices, it wouldn't treat anyone. So I think play a rugby where the horse riding should be excluded on those grounds as well. Um, I think that kind of mentality that it's about, um, you know, a kind of competitive access uh, and the kind of taxpayer alliance type mentality sets patients against each other. Uh, and ignores the fact that the resources in, in, back in 2007 aren't weren't as limited as they are today. There's a wider issue of the economy and what's going on there. And it's, instead of the government turning it in, into a kind of very individuated lifestyle uh, based discussion. Um, I think that, in conclusion, the patients are kind of being given a, a crude facsimile, consumerist choice through things like choose and book for hospital appointments, whilst they're actually more autonomy in their private lives. Uh, and the right to treatment that they've already paid for through their taxes is completely stripped, uh, stripped away. And I think the GPs are also uh, being given a kind of market like model to them, where they have a clinical freedom to say no to people because of financial reason, reasons of lifestyle choice. Um, uh, but the, the actual clinical management that they do is mandated by government target uh, and their self government professionalism is gone. So I believe it Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be tough, I think. I think, I think, um, I think the GP's role, clinical role, they need to protect, and I think what we do every day is the most valuable thing that we can contribute to the to the NHS um, with our teams. Um, and but I do think that we've got to get real about the money we have, but uh, and we also need to get real, as the lady from the state said, we don't know how lucky we are with what we have at the moment. We have no idea how lucky we are with what we have at the moment. And I think we all need to defend that. Thank you, Michael. Right. Okay, fine. Right, so how do you sum this lot up? Look, I mean, what was interesting about the, the questions was, was how they veered off the role of the GP and got into the tangled undergrowth of the mess the NHS is finding itself in. And the GPs have to deal with that, of course, on a daily basis. Look, i just say this. GPs are as misty-eyed about their job as the rest of us. 
and we all need to get a reality check. The GPs have let the NHS slip through their fingers. Um, we will end up with probably 30 PCT commissioning support units and 30,000 GPs apologising for it. Uh, so I think the game's up, and the only thing that you need to worry about when you're dangling your grandchildren on your knee and they ask the awkward question, how will you answer, where were you when the NHS disappeared? Give me 